Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, as she said, my name is Gaurav Vyas. I am the CTO and co-founder of Radiant Mobility. We are a mobility, wellness, and physiotherapy tech startup uh, out of Mumbai, uh, India. Um, I just have a quick question. Uh, how many of you have been to physiotherapy? Anyone? Couple people here and there. Okay, so for everyone who hasn't, um, basically physiotherapy has a few stages. One of them is you go into your doctor's office and he or she will diagnose you. Um, the second stage is you come back in the beginning, uh, maybe once every two, three days to you know, come back in uh, to your doctor's office for some um, you know, massage therapy or you know, just to do your exercises. And the third thing is the bulk of it where they give you these home exercises to do um, every single day. It's about 15 minutes um, of exercises. It's, it's uh, very simple, but it's very integral to actually um, you know, your recovery. And what we've noticed is 70% 70, 70 of people that go into physiotherapy don't do these exercises. And what happens is that kind of prolongs their uh, recovery time. It leads to recurring injuries. And it uh, leads to kind of, it, it could lead to surgery down the road. Um, I myself, I'm an avid sportsman. Uh, I've had a lot of injuries. I've uh, gone through a lot of physiotherapy. Um, I recently turned 26, so my back started hurting. Um, and what really I realized is it's just all about doing these home exercises every single day in order to get back to your, um, you know, your, your peak fitness. Um, so what we've built is this mobile application that uses the camera on your phone to track these exercises. Our AI will track these exercises. We tell you whether you're doing this correctly, whether you're doing it incorrectly. Um, we motivate you. And at the end of the day, we send a report card to your physiotherapist. So what happens is you know, your physiotherapist gets this invaluable data of you know, your home exercises. And they can use that to do a data-driven recovery approach. Um, and so that's pretty much uh, who we are as Radiant Mobility. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Fadi Hindi. I'm the general manager for Olive AI. Uh, we're a startup out of the United States, um, and we were founded in 2014. We're the uh, kind of like the automation company for healthcare systems, uh, both uh, providers and payers. Uh, we're in about 1,000 hospitals in the United States, um, and we've uh, done a few pivots over the years. Um, we kind of pride ourselves on uh, uh, having a higher purpose and trying to change healthcare by driving out inefficiencies and automating, uh, as well as alleviating the burnout of frontline workers um, from you know, the administrative tasks and the mundane, uh, you know, repeatable tasks and just get that done through AI and digital assistance and AI coworkers. So um, just out of curiosity, I think uh, we were speaking about, uh, about the, uh, the chat and we were thinking about what is it that we're gonna be talking about. So um, we figured maybe we'll just start by asking you, how many of you are in, how many doctors or healthcare professionals do we have? None? Okay, uh, so just out of curiosity, did you guys just like happen to stumble into this room or like where you come from? What do you do? You, how about you? Food, which is, impacts your health, absolutely. Anybody else? Yeah, we'll get you a mic. everyone. <laughs> so how did I, or us, get here? It started out as Food 2.0. Okay. And then um, I would say a couple of months back, I was told that Food 2.0, sorry, merged with Help 2.0. And to be honest with you, and I must be honest. Please. I said, I'm a chef. Why are they putting me with the health 
And then it dawned on me, something that I'm always saying to my students, food is health, health is food. So it made sense. What do y'all think? Okay. <laughs> so the majority of you are, are food, like food sciences or food industry? Yes, no? So come on guys, you're not in health, you're not in food. I mean, you know, where are you coming from? <laughs> I, I don't think they expected the fireside. They, they wanted to. They wanted us to do something. They weren't know, expecting the fireside to fire to at fire them. back. You yeah. know, it's, uh, so go ahead. Um, so I think, in terms of AI, uh, what would be interesting to talk about? You know, everyone. You know, with with hello. Yeah. With um, you know, with with the news and the metaverse and AR and VR. You know, these these buzz buzzwords are being thrown around with like you know encompassed with AI. And what I think would be interesting for health, food, fitness, mobility, um, you know, whatever we are, uh, whatever you're, you're here for is how AI and human, collab the rise of AI and human collaboration, right? Um, so, we, you know, uh, I think a lot of people could be worried that, you know, with the rise of AI, they would replace human jobs. Um, but honestly, I don't believe that's true with, with both our, um, you know, tech companies, our tech applications. The goal of it is more to identify areas where AI could, um, you know, could uh, help humans, could make human processes more efficient, so that humans could be could focus on, you know, doing what we do best, right? In terms of diagnosis, in terms of understanding other humans. Um, so, for example, radiant mobility. We our, our main pillar when we started this company is. We don't want to replace the physiotherapist, right? It's all about, um, you know, giving the physiotherapist the data and giving the physiotherapist an insight into their client's home workout routines, you know, providing them a pre-appointment, um, you know, diagnos uh, diagnostic assessment, once again, with data uh, that they can use uh, to drive their client's recovery. And in the end, the client and the physiotherapist are both having an, you know, a more efficient experience and reducing the recovery time, which is the ultimate goal of, of physiotherapy. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think as far as uh, automation and artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's a constant fear of um, AI and uh, taking over jobs. I think we've heard that you know, throughout, and whether you're in food or whether you're in health or whether you're in education, uh, there's definitely that, that fear of um, machines taking over. And um, our, you know, our philosophy also is about, uh, if you've noticed, I was hitting on allevi alleviating the human suffering um, because we believe that there's a lot of human suffering as a result of technology that is disconnected. Um, and definitely healthcare is one of those industries, and I'm sure it's prevalent across many different industries. So the way that we look at AI is how can it bring and how can it bridge some of these gaps and make the, uh, the jobs of people and humans more enjoyable and more focused on adding value, like to patients or to uh, the stakeholder, rather than acting as a router between systems. And even, you know, like, human's perception of AI, right? How many of you have ever called a health line and allowed the robot or the, the automated voice to actually solve your problem, right? We usually press nine as quick as possible to try to get to the human uh, employee and try to get him or her to fix it, right? So yes, that the goal of that automated voice could be to solve the problem or the goal could be to get all the required data such as, you know, who I am, what I'm here for, to direct me to the correct uh, consumer. So whether it's, as, as Fadi said, whether it's, it's food or whether it's healthcare, you know, even in the food industry, right, it's all, the data today and the AIs that are being used in food delivery apps, being used on even Pinterest boards, being used uh, through Facebook, are actually giving us a better idea of what the human taste bud is, right? And that's where AI, you know, you know, I, it's not about a burger flipping, uh, sorry, a robot flipping a burger, right? It's more about a burger flipping a robot. That would, that would, be, <laughs> that would be fun. Um, it's more about taking that data, taking the AI to do the mundane tasks of 
you know, figuring out or, or processing gigabytes of data, aggregating all that data and giving it to um, the healthcare professionals, the food professionals, um, and so on and so forth. Very good. Questions? Yes. Ah, we got a question. All right. I think we're doing this right. I think so. Hi. Uh, as you know, India is like a vast country, a uh, lot of languages. Your app would be giving all the information to the patient, whether he is doing wrong exercise or right exercise, that would be in English or maybe in Hindi. So how would you make your app reach to the remote places? So I think the beauty of it is that it's when you build it in layers, right? When you build technology in layers, and that's pretty much what you're taught in engineering school is the detection portion and the actual communication portion are built completely separately. So if I can detect that my back is bent when I'm doing a certain exercise, my detection portion kind of tells me that the back is bent in terms of maybe a number or you know however I want to interpret it. And then the communication layer, which is the super important layer, uh, can communicate it in any language you know possible. Um, I think this actually touches upon the benefit of the app that you know just because you're in a remote village and you may not be able to speak the language of the doctor that is treating you, this technology can kind of um, you know leap over those barriers and help people either you know give it a more um, a, 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 you know as I, as I said, uh, leap over the language barrier, or even you know using AR form like visual aids, right? Like if I'm the, what we're trying to develop is um, if I'm supposed to do an exercise like this, if on my screen there's a ball, right, and I, all I have to tell the patient is just keep hitting that ball, right? It's more of visual guidance along with audio guidance in their language. So it's not even about whether you understand the language, whether you speak the language, or you know what your literally le level is, as you said, in, in maybe that may be lower in remote villages. But the act of if there's a ball over there, and the act of doing this and hitting a ball is the same to all of us, regardless of what language we speak. So again, it's all about providing physiotherapists those tools to enhance uh, the client experience, whether it's an in-person client experience, whether it's a remote client experience. And then on the flip side, I don't need my client to tell me in whatever their language uh, or whatever language they speak, whether they, or how they feel or whether they did the exercise, right? I can kind of see it through the AI and then it becomes basically in terms of numbers because 30 degrees is 30 degrees in you know, all different languages. Um, so that's our, uh, that kind of benefits us or that is one of our benefits more than something that we see as a problem. I don't know if you wanted to. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, yeah of yeah. course. What about the security of the data? Because uh, generally what happens, like uh, don't take it otherwise, but generally the companies, they sell those data and they make another chunk of money out of it. So. Any plans of that? So the, <laughs> so the security of the data, again, is with any company, you have to have super secure systems, one from, you know, from when you said security, and I'm sure in terms of hacking, in terms of encryption, because it is um, health data. Um, this data is super valuable, so, you know, the risk and, or the benefit is that you have to de-anonymize it, ensure that you're not selling user data. If you are, you know, you're, you're mainly trying to sell trends and you're selling patterns, which honestly could loop back into research, right? If I can tell you that people, most people doing these exercises kind of uh, of this age face these problems, right? You know, it's more of trying to loop it back into healthcare research and enhancing the product, enhancing the AI, as well as enhancing our understanding of the, the human body. Um, I hope that kind of answered your question. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, he's. Ah, yes. Hi. Um, we're from the food industry, since you asked. <laughs> so I was, I, was, I, wanted, I was wondering how, what would you guys in your respective companies or respective apps or uh, would you like to see as an added value from the food industry? We're in, we're in production of food, different kinds of healthy or not or whatever. So what would you like to see from a food industry, a production of food, add value to your business? And how would it work? Okay, 
Um, that's a very good question, actually, and I think that if we um, if, if we if we look at the um, you know the higher purpose, we believe every company should have a higher purpose, right? So if you look at Olive, the higher purpose for Olive is to uh, drive inefficiencies out of healthcare, improve patient care, um, and do it in a way that. Uh, makes the lives of people that are participating in this ecosystem better and happier. So the way that I would look at this would be from the standpoint of um, if you're looking at the entire life cycle, like taking care of the patient, we, we see a long-term uh, vision of actually having uh, wearable devices and being able to go with the patient to their home to monitor their uh, blood pressure to monitor th their exercise, for example, we're talking about physiotherapy over here, we see the food being on the front end of that, right? So what kind of foods are they consuming? How can we bring that data in and look at um, the, the holistic kind of record for that particular patient to understand what they're eating, what ailments are they facing, and what preventive medicine uh, could actually be offered to that particular patient? I think that's a much more valuable um, kind of outcome than separating these different things. I believe that the problem of these silos, regardless of industry, is always the, the downfall of, uh, you know, and failure of those industries because we're creating these silos. So the food is alone, medicine is alone, you know, pharmacy is alone, and diagnosis is alone, and physiotherapy is alone, but it's not a holistic kind of picture. So that would be my take. I don't know, what do you think? No, no, um, I, I pretty much agree. I think in terms of you know, physiotherapy, as he said, physiotherapy kind of once you're recovered leads to fitness, which you know, is a close cousin or a close sibling of the food industry, right? And so um, I think where tech could actually help the food industry and the food industry could actually help tech is providing um, more sustainable diet plans based on human behavior, right? I think a lot of people are on these very stringent, non, um, you know, uh, sustainable diet plans, and I've tried to be on them myself for, you know, fitness as well as whatever, and it's, you know, understanding human behavior through, you know, analytics, through data, through AI, through um, performance monitoring, through these wearables, and catering specific sustainable diet plans to, um, you know, to, to uh, different or, or to these individuals that subscribe to them, um, I think that could be um, that that could be super interesting way for the food industry, the fitness industry, the health industry to collaborate. Can, can we ask actually how, uh, from your perspective, how much is AI prevalent in food today, in the food industry? Are you guys seeing a lot of use for AI and machine learning or no? Thanks. I'm actually a culinary educator at um, Escofia School of Culinary Arts and we were online. So, and this was before COVID. So um, I see how beneficial it is in regards to being directly with the student at home. The student yeah. doesn't have to leave. Now, it's not quite AI in the sense that you were speaking, but I can see that we're headed in that way. Um, you mentioned the metaverse. I find all of that very interesting because as a, someone um, that owns a restaurant, not myself, it can be great for marketing. Yeah. Right? We saw what Nike did. They went in and they bought the real estate. Well, all of these people now are venturing into the metaverse to play right. and so forth. So as foodies, those people like to eat too in the metaverse. So we can advertise yeah. to you know, those avatars within the metaverse and they spend their money there too. So I, I think it could be beneficial. I was being cute, hold on. <laughs> Very good. I, I think it could be beneficial. Uh, anybody else have seen um, like use of data and AI in, in your industry? Thanks. Uh, 
we're, we're, we're now seeing a lot of innovation in the food space where they're, you know, they have been examining food security. Yep. And if there's a portion of the population that needs to be fed because they're starving, why would we do anything other than try to feed them good food? So we're really talking not just about food security, but an opportunity to create nutritional security. And in being able to improve the diets of those people, we've seen some of the early data has come in during COVID where people have turned to food as a form of immunization yeah. against COVID. So the, in terms of the data that's coming in right now, it's leaving a lot of space for AI to be able to work, to be able to help solve some of these areas and really be able to um, help create the conversation for the future of food. Yeah. You know, uh, you talked about food security. Um, a, a long time ago, um, I did some work for one of the ministries, Ministry of Economy, I believe, around early warning system for food shortages. And uh, I'll just share this with you from an AI and ML standpoint because this is relevant for your industry. Um, the more data that you have about the cycles where food shortages have been created, um, the more that you'd be able to understand and predict what could be happening based on certain parameters that you're seeing. So to me, that's a direct application of AI and machine learning to your industry. Uh, you can identify what are, the, uh, what are the key attributes that have caused certain shortages and then train a machine to actually look for those indicators and then let you know when there's a potential you know, food shortage or crisis that's coming you know, well in advance for that particular point. As a follow-up, using machine learning and using AI in terms of the food security and being able to feed the population that is not getting enough food, we can see the increase of operating efficiencies as well through those processes in terms of food waste and the food waste alone could probably feed all of those people. Yeah. So we're talking about increasing efficiencies and, and uh, waste reduction. Yeah. And I, I think that there is a clear application for AI and machine learning in that regard. Yeah. Uh, are, they, are there anybody in food production, like in the audience, like an actual... Uh, farming and bringing food from farms and into into the like into the market okay you want to say something no i thought there's a there was a question at the back no just a, uh, not a question but just a perspective i feel that um apart from data there's absolute need of advocacy to complement that strategy for any security because um, the way we sit in the world right now full of fake news and you know yeah. data being manipulated and also being limited to the rich and the digitally you know uh, aware uh, class in the society uh, there's not enough data anyways being um, you know um, being generated from those parts of the society where there isn't an infrastructure so you know, classic example is this chef called Jamie Oliver, uh, who's, you know, started advocating tax on sugar and, you know, lunch meals for kids and prisoners turning into chefs, right? I think that sort of movement is absolutely, absolutely vital, at least in my view, uh, to make the right use and the, you know, um, cogniz uh, cognition of the data for the right purposes. Absolutely. I think... Um you know, just to build on that that point in terms of the training of the data as well. You know, you don't want, you know, as as he said, that the, just the the ML outputs only catering to the rich or the ML perspectives only catering to the people whose data that we have, right? Um, you know, I think you don't want these biases that are there against, you know, uh, you know, discriminating against gender, discriminating against um, uh, against uh, race, right? Mainly. Um, and so this advocacy is super important to try to collect data as well as train, uh, as well as regulate these ML, um, you know, algorithms that are going to drive this AI. Um, 
And I think that is also going to be something of a proliferation of human jobs with uh, the more pre the prevalence of uh, ML and AI increasing. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask, like, for example, as you talk about security, for an example, if I am giving you my information of like, it's a very personal detail if I'm working out or not, it's very crucial to me. Is there any kind of an agreement or something you'll be signing off or we will be signing off to build up the trust that yes, it won't be going out of hand unless I'm informed about it. First is that and secondly, I feel people are really, people have trust issues when it comes to uh, trusting the MI, AR, VR, all of these technologies. First, they think they're taking off their our jobs and we won't be out, we will be all out of jobs. Secondly, they don't uh, expect them to know the human um, brain. They don't have the human brain, even though they are smart, whatever, but they don't think that they'll have that accuracy, even though that is. So how can you bring that trust into people to you know, go ahead and ad adapt all of these new technologies in our industry? Okay, yeah, I think, um, well, first of all, anything that's related to data has to be, um, it's gonna have to be these terms and conditions where the customer or patient or participating individual in that particular platform, they know what they're giving up and what are they getting. Um, and there's, corp you know, social responsibility for any corporation to make sure that there's no monetization or exploitation of that data. I mean, whether that happens or not, it's neither here nor, I mean, it's gonna depend, but there's gonna have to be, uh, you know, I think regulators are gonna also have to play a part. Otherwise, you know, it will open the door for interpretation or use of that data for sure. So to answer your question, and, I, and I'll speak specifically about like uh, our company, Olive, we have very strict regulations and, and guidelines on what we can do with the data, how we use the data and, and whether you know we can leverage that data, and as uh, my colleague was saying here, um, you cannot you cannot use individual data. Usually, you have to look at trends or aggregate data. Generally, that's the rule across all industries, right? Now, on the second part of your question, um, I have lived firsthand the uh, bringing AI and ML into uh, into organizations. I've taken a, a, a 300 plus, actually 1,200, you know, in one in, in one life, 1,200 people, to use di digital transformation, AI, and machine learning, and get them to leverage that technology. And then later, as a as a chief executive for a, for a corporation, of bringing AI and ML to 300 uh, person company to take it to the next level as far as transformation. And uh, it was just like pulling teeth. It's very hard. Um, you know, we like the idea. It sounds great. You know, it sounds romantic. Yeah, AI, ML, etc. But the minute that robot, and it doesn't have to be a physical robot, it could be a program. The minute it actually hits the doorstep of the enterprise, things change. And people get really, really defensive. So, what we have been able to, what I was able to do, and it, it was a growth opportunity for me because if you think about it as, a, as an implementer or somebody that's bringing that particular discipline to an organization, you see it. It's a no-brainer, right? It makes a lot of sense. Guys, let's just implement this. But then to take 200 or 300 people or 1,000 people to actually take that on, it's a totally different challenge. The human brain works differently. So the way that we were able to address that is to, is to explain, what you gotta do is you gotta do a lot of, uh, not handhold, but you gotta do a lot of education about what we're trying to do is improve the type of work that you're doing. We wanna take away the mundane work. We don't wanna take away your job. We wanna make your job better. This is what we want uh, AI to do. And this is how we were able to get people to actually buy in. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you this one story and then I'll turn it over to my colleague. I, for me, at one point it was very easy. There was one particular um, 
a part of the business that's doing underwriting and they were handling something like 15 applications per week. And we tried to explain over and over and over about use, a, let's just use these uh, AI models to help you do the underwriting and the risk assessment. They wouldn't do it. So after many tries, I said, okay, no problem. We're gonna open the floodgates. And what we're gonna do, you wanna process it manually? No problem. We're gonna triple the volume of applications that are coming into uh, your door. Now, whether you wanna do it manually or leverage the computer, it's up to you. But I expect, as the chief executive, I expect all of these to be done in the morning. It took two days, and then they completely switched over, like, all right, run day. <laughs> so at the end, you know, it's only common sense. And it, it took, it's interesting because the, the moral of the story, it took about two months, even with the AI turned on, it took about two months for them to say, all right, now we get it. I get it, because I'm enjoying my job more. Now, after seeing the AI run, and the AI is taking care of the, you know, the, the paper shuffling and taking data from this system and putting it in that system and you know, OCRing the information on the form versus having a human do it. So their higher level brain functions got engaged and all of a sudden they started enjoying their job. But that takes time. I think we all are scared after watching Terminator. We all came to know about AI from there. That, yeah, you can go ahead. No, uh, I think you pretty much hit the nail on the head just to add a little bit to the, the initial question of you know, data privacy as we move into what you know, I, many of you might heard of as Web 3.0. Right, where there's no one central entity that may own the data, and you know whether it's blockchain that kind of takes over, or you know how we move into that era where, where people are more cognizant of their own um, of, of their data as well as their privacy. Um, I think user consent, user, uh, you know, company selling data is going to become much more uh, a little more restrictive, um, and the power is going to come back to the users just because there is no one central entity that alone the data, so each individual will have to, uh, or will get, the, will get the chance to own their own data. That's a conversation for Health 3.0. Any other questions? We have a red blinking screen here, I don't know. We do. Do we get ejected, just James Bond style? I think we're done, yeah? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you for everyone. listening to us.